Hi, I'm Randy Wise, curator at the Fremont County Pioneer Museum in Lander. Welcome to our first virtual speaker series. This is an unusual year, so we're doing things a little differently. And since we can't get groups of people together, we're going to do a few things like some of our treks and some of our speakers virtually. Tonight's speaker is James Stewart, who is a professor at Central Wyoming College and a student of Native American art. And he's talking about his personal collection of ledger art, which is on display at the Pioneer Museum through the fall of 2020. And parts of it will be on display after that. I'm Jim Stewart. I uh, teach uh, primitive art, uh, petroglyphs for Central Wyoming College. My assistant right here is Bill Elder. And petroglyphs, basically, if we look at ledger art as being an extension of the same ideas as we had with petroglyphs and pictographs, such as like out at Red Canyon, Sinks Canyon, uh, Castle Gardens, that sort of place that as you move towards what ends up being the registration period, we have where they're no longer out nomadically going from rock face to rock face. Uh, and this, this is uh, Shoshonean uh, that the picture's of. Uh, has to do with Chief Washkey. Now I have no ledger art that has to do with the Shoshones. I do have one a wrap all piece, which I'll talk about in, in a minute. And some of this is young again, that's from Carl Jung. And he, uh, psychologist, psychiatrist, sociologist, from the 1920s right up to 1960s, uh, internationally known. And he talks about that mankind has some habits that he thinks are born into us. And one is to do artwork. And this we don't find with uh, other primates. We don't find it unless they've been trained deliberately as a trick, like a circus or whatever, uh, to try and produce art. Mankind does that. Uh, so far, they don't have any other uh, animals that create art for art's sake, which we do. Um, but one of the things that he says is that we have this collective memory that he thinks that we were born with. And the theory is that it doesn't matter what genetic background you have, what family you belong to, whatever you're born with it, it's part of being a human. And as we grow up in a society it becomes a societal memory, a cultural memory, as well as a personal memory and a group memory. So when we look at these, we can say that on some of these very easily, this is part of a personal memory or this is part of a cultural memory. So when we look at these, we need to look at these from the intent of the artist, the person who created them. Okay, and when we have the word remember, it comes from the word mimesis, and that means we sort of imitate what we see. And we're gonna to expect to see uh, in this group, uh, the show, uh, things that were viewed in real time by somebody who acted in it, and then they're trying to store it somehow to go back and remember it or to show it to somebody else in the group is that some of the most historical pieces have more information for us to talk about than some of the ones that are very attractive. Uh, in other words, uh, just because it's attractive doesn't make it necessarily better than another one. This piece right here represents the attack on Julesburg in 1865. It's done by the lean bear, and if you move in and look right here, this is his name right there, saying he is lean bear, all right? And he is chasing a soldier, and he's taken his bow and touched that soldier with it, which is a coup count sort of thing. Now, if we go to this panel right here, 
These are called name glyphs. And out of the show, we have about six or eight of these name glyphs in this show. You know, those pieces that have that. And that includes uh, Lean Bear here. Uh, Lean Bear was Cheyenne. And in response to the November uh, Sand Creek Massacre, this is like four months later in the start of 1865. And the Cheyennes get together, Northern Cheyennes, and I don't know how many Southern Cheyennes they had with them or who else. And they attack a place called Julesburg. Julesburg is about two miles from Fort Sedgwick, which is up in the uh, northeast corner of Colorado, just about to the Nebraska uh, borderline. And we're Wyoming, Nebraska, and Wyoming, Colorado come together right there in the corner. And it was part of the Oregon Trail. Julesburg was the civilian part of that. And uh, the Cheyennes came in, they raided it. One of the tricks they did here was they suckered the soldiers in the attack to think that they needed to go back into their fort to defend themselves, which they did and then they massacred the town. Now that massacre word is a white guy term used, uh, your American term, used against Native Americans doing anything, where if it goes the other direction, they don't, they don't use that term. Uh, depends on uh, who, who, who the so-called victim is. This to me historically is a pretty neat piece. This, is by, I think, the same artist. It's on the same paper, which is only four pages of legal document from 1849. And this artist is not gonna be as elaborate as some of the other artists that we're gonna have in this show. And so going back to my comment, sometimes what they present is more information in it than the fancy ones. We got a couple of real fancy ones that I can't say as much about as I can possibly about the Julesburg one and this one being on paper from the same document. And there's four pieces of paper that I got and one of those others is in the show also. So like I said, there's only four sheets. Uh, is a Cheyenne just like we had over there with uh, Lean Bear. And uh, his name is Great Fighter. Uh, the native uh, drawing this and the other ones in the show, they're using any paper they can get until I get to a couple that the paper I think is deliberately purchased or acquired for doing uh, a drawing. But most of it is old books. That's why they're called ledger, ledger art. Uh, they're getting old ledgers from businesses or whoever. This is a legal ledger uh, that they're using then. Some of the drawings have not in the show uh, are basically sketches that are going to be completed later on, I think, by the artist uh, with color added. And this is one of those. This shows bullets hitting the horse, bullets hitting the guy on the horse. And bullets going through the air. As the artist gets more and more tools to work with, such as colored pencils, uh, you can come out with a very elaborate looking piece. Uh, now this is a cover of a book. So these ledger books are the same ones that some businesses still use something akin to it. If you go down to Reed's office uh, supply, then it won't be the exact one, of course, but they'd still sell ledger books for people to deal with. In this show, I have one Arapaho piece, no Shoshone pieces, and that's this one right here. And the seller knew it was Arapaho and nothing else. Uh, what, lo and behold, when I went out on the internet, I found that a museum had a very similar one with a different page number on it. 
and they don't know the artist's name, so they call him Henderson Ledger Artist A. Uh, and if I look at this book right here, he is well liked by the person putting this book out by taking another piece by the same artist. When you show the side of an animal, horse, whatever it is, it's called profile. It typically shows an action, not always, sometimes a little bit static. We've got a, at least one or two drawings that are reasonably static. Um, but if the person or the animal is facing you, it's frontal, and that's a portrait. Now this artist, which made him easy, and why he's probably on the cover of that book, is he has a horse profile, and he has the warrior frontal for his face, but not his body. And same for the horse. This is pretty sophisticated. Now this is a name glyph right here, and we still don't know what it is. Uh, none of the books I've seen this picture in, or in, you know, they just have him as the artist. Uh, they don't know what glyph this is, and he's not in this series of glyphs here, but he's going to have a name sort of like Ghost Horse or White Horse or something like that, just the way it's set up. And he was captured in 1875. He's a Kiowa. He was down in the Red River area around Texas, and the Army came out and arrested him as a warrior, and he dies either in 78 or 78. He's released about 78 by the U.S. Army as a prisoner, and he dies, I think, in 79. In the same picture, we have a Cheyenne dog. So we have a Kiowa, we have a Cheyenne. This person's name is Making Medicine. Now, that's his Indian name. Making Medicine was arrested along with uh, Koba in 1875, and he changes his name. He becomes an Episcopal, Episcopal minister, and this is a photograph of what he looks like as a minister as opposed to what he looked like as a warrior, and we're lucky enough to have one of the pieces of his art in the show while he was still in prison, and the prison is called Fort Marion, and it's in St. Augustine, Florida. Uh, it was an old prison. It had a lot of fungus and stuff in the walls, and some of the prisoners died of tuberculosis, and that's probably what happened to Koba. All the artwork that they know he did, none of it was warrior stuff. It was hunting stuff as a subject matter, and that happens here. What's interesting on this piece is if we look this rider and the quiver right here, and same on this rider and the quiver, those are lion skin, where they skinned a full lion, the mountain lion, and made the quiver out of it. And that shows up in his artwork. This, this artist, I don't know who this artist is. I'm pretty sure the artist is Sue. I think this drawing might be early 1900s. Uh, whoever the artist was, deliberately bought, if you look in this groupie here, uh, paper that's not ledgers that had been read, uh, written on already, uh, but brand new paper, uh, and quite large too. But the person knew to have this. Now keep in mind, if this artist was 1920, and he was born in 1850, he'd, he'd be 70 years old, younger than me. Uh, he could still have gone through all the Indian Wars and still be producing artwork, all right? But I want you to take, look at this red sash. It loops around his neck, it comes down here, and he's got a spear in his hand, and it probably has a coup in on the other end, that's sort of like a crook on a, on a cane. And that means this guy is quite a warrior, not just because of this bonnet here. People assume the bonnet's all of it. Uh, this guy, the information I read is if he got off his horse, he would take and he would stake that end of the sash to the ground and he would stay 
with that sash keep being on a tether like a dog on, on a leash. And he would fight in that place and challenge anybody to come up and try and kill him. And it was considered quite a military honor. So this guy fits into this category. And uh, that's the same we had with the other one. We look down here. We have another red sash person. We look up here. Another red sash person. So we, this artist knows about this Red Sash Society, and I think if we thought the guy was much later than particularly uh, the first of World War II, the first of World War II would be 40 plus whatever year he was born in, in the 1800s. So if he was born in 1860, and he fought as a 16 year, the person fought as a 16 year old, in the 1870s, uh, by the time we were hitting, particularly uh, World War II, these older warriors are dying off. And we're gonna see some of these habits of knowing what that red sash does disappearing out of the artwork. And this piece, and, and just because a piece has some physical problems to it, uh, I still bought some. This is. A drawing of Sitting Bull, and he has a coup stick. We were just talking about one of these cane like ends to it, and he's knocking down a person uh, to show that he's quite brave. And here is the name glyph Sitting Bull drawn right here. However, the artist puts his name down here, uh, 1898 drawing, so Sitting Bull did not draw this. This piece by Sam Lummel is exactly what I'm saying is that by the time it gets later on, this 1915, and we have artists who did not live through some of this trying to create artwork, their artwork lacks some of the elements that the earlier artists had. And Lomo is a good example. But Lomo was selling to a touristy uh, Caucasian Euro-American Euro audience and he was working at one of these Wild West shows. And by the time he gets his hands on the idea to sell to, again, a white tourist type person at a Wild West show, he ends up with this. And all at once we have a big American flag, not here in the original. We have then uh, all sorts of attacking Indians that change in terms of how they operate uh, in his artwork. And our interest is in this person, and his name is Red Crow. Here we have uh, an artist's name is Red Dog. We'll talk about this piece right here. But the drawing is of Red Crow. So we know the artist is Red Dog, and they come out of pages out of the same ledger book. We know the subject matter is um, Red Crow. This is his symbol for his clan, his warrior society on his shield. This is one of those spears that has a coup end and it has a spear end, so he can either kill a person as a warrior or he can tap them as a coup. Coup being a fancy word for making extra points uh, because of bravery. Um, this, I think, also possibly, at least by how his uh, nose is drawn and everything else, and it comes out of the same book, is also probably uh, Red Crow. Red Dog, the artist, he was born a home papa. He marries Red Cloud, very, very, very famous chief from the Indian Wars in the 1860s. He marries his sister, and he then becomes a, an Oglala, 1864. This would be right after probably the uh, Sand Creek Massacre. He wants to go to war with the U.S. Army. By 1867 uh, to 68, he is for uh, a peace delegation. 
he has uh, changed uh, his ideas. He goes on up and I think lives uh, until about 1920s or so. Uh, he lived on the Pine River, uh, Pine Ridge Reservation. Uh, this picture right here, uh, approximately 1883. So what we have is we have the artist and the subject matter by name. And that doesn't happen very much in this show. We've only got a couple pieces that do that. Uh, most of them, we either have the artist that we can identify or the subject matter we can identify. We can't identify both of them. And when they came out with the federal government came out with a $5 note, uh, they wanted his picture on it and he's Sue. But if you notice, there's a full war bonnet on that note. And that's because an artist in Washington, D.C. didn't like just the, th the three feathers. And so he puts a full, full bonnet up, but he picks a Pawnee bonnet to put on him. Those guys are enemies. They're really irritated uh, running antelope, who was Sue. These guys were enemies. And to put a, an enemy's war bonnet on him was considered an insult. About four pieces that were done by Running Antelope. Uh, this piece does not have his name glyph on it, but it has all the other elements of uh, the shield and everything else that has to do uh, with uh, Running Antelope. Again, this, his shield is a clan thing, just so you know. I ended up getting two pieces of art by the same artist of the same subject matter right here and it took me being confused for a little while of which one was which this is Ty Creek South Dakota we don't know who the artist is now where we have fancy uh, clothing on with some of these warrior pictures uh, and you've already seen a couple that do that and the one below is going to do that. Here we have the warrior wearing very little clothing, which is probably closer to reality for uh, some of these summer attacks. Uh, and he is uh, dispatching a uh, U.S. soldier or a cavalryman. All right. Now the next one down. Here we have, there's another one in one of the books with this person here actually having a sword in their hand and dispatching this uh, crow. And you say, well, how do you know he's a crow? See this haircut right here? With a bundle on top? This person is, is a crow. We don't know him by name, okay? But we do know because of this haircut, this bundle on top, and this long sort of woven hair coming down in terms of artwork anyway. These draw, this drawing and the one below it, in fact all four of these are by uh, a soon named Blackhawk. This sort of treatment of the horses, because of course they had curly hair. We typically don't see horses with curly hair, they have straight hair. And that's what this trying to do. Uh, we have again uh, Black Hawk down here uh, fighting a crow. I don't think it's the same crow because this one's bow and arrow. This one has a gun. This is running. And remember the red sash sort of thing? Have it again. No eyes. And so the question becomes why no eyes? But it's so these people could, the artist who did this, is drawing other people. And he doesn't want to be visited by, spiritually by, somebody he drew without that person's permission. If the person's dead, he doesn't want to get a spirit visiting him in the middle of the night or whenever, uh, wanting to know why he called him back with having the ice in there. So there's gonna be a bunch in the one we just did over here. No, face, no facial features. So the mouth on these guys, yes. Uh, when we're looking close, see the stripes, the colors? That 
those are badges. That's that's like seeing a colonel or a major, or a lieutenant or a sergeant, whatever. Uh, typically, this goes with upper upper end uh, warriors. Uh, the museum, uh, Randy Wise, uh, used it for doing the logo for this whole show, and then uh, he and I together sat down and we picked out a series of postcard uh, motifs. And so the museum actually has published already, and they're in the bookstore, four different postcards, and he wants to do some more. Yellow Bear gives us a lot of information that carries over for the other draw drawings that we have, ledger drawings. Uh, a lot of times he's going to have this partner with him. I do not know who his partner is. Uh, what we can tell is, remember we talked about no facial features, basically? Even the soldiers don't have facial features. He doesn't want whoever did this drawing work, which I think is Yellow Bear himself. That's my guess. Uh, because of, there's so many uh, with so much information in them. If we look at this officer, this is a infantry officer, U.S. Army. Uh, Yellow Bear is killing him with a spear. This is where he's killing him, but this says he's dead. The red coming out of his mouth. So when we start looking around, here's a wounded infantryman, and here's a dead infantryman. And we tell by the blood coming out. And if we find a horse with blood coming out of the mouth, same thing. Or an animal, such as a bison or a buffalo, whatever. He is dressed in his finest clothes. He's got his coup stick, he's got his bonnet on. He's meeting his wife. This is a formal meeting. Now, whether it's the actual wedding, I don't know, or the first meeting, only this little tag tells me, and it tells me his name is Yellow Bear. And when I go out then on uh, the internet, I start looking up Yellow Bear. Sure enough, we find Yellow Bear being quite a warrior. He's born in the 40s. Uh, picture him. So, yes, this sort of tells us what we're looking at uh, that I showed you a second ago. One of the interesting things about Yellow Bear, he starts showing us, besides warrior stuff, he starts showing us village stuff, like this one, of traders coming to trade them a bunch of weapons, uh, the village and the teepees in the background, uh, that sort of thing. Don't find that with a bunch of these other artists. I also have him just showing women as women, uh, and uh, showing off how good a warrior uh, he was, if this is his wife again, I don't know, or his children, uh, or a combination. And they have these umbrellas, uh, sign of wealth, sort of like, when did you buy your well a wife? I bought her a real fancy umbrella, parasol, okay? Uh, it's the same sort of thing. Same thing on, on horses. Uh, which is not just Native American, worldwide still is. You got horses that go for mega, mega bucks still. Has to do with breeding, has to do with training. But anyway, Yellow Bear turned out a lot of things. These covers that have been done on a large record book, and the, the book is like 1902, so that tells them that the artwork is probably 1904, 1910, 1915, wherever. Doesn't tell me the artist's name. And this is basically the same, if I look at this, the horse, the spear, the guy on, we got it on the cover. The, art, the artist here is Black Hawk. He's Lakota Sands Ark Sioux. About 1881 or three, he drew a drawing like this in the one on the cover of the book you're just looking at. They were dreams they had. So let's start analyzing a little bit. Uh, this is called a Thunder Beast. Uh, and that's the term that Black Hawk put on himself about his dream. And it's a destructive character. Uh, and if we look at the eye, 
on the bison. It's typically yellow. The eye is yellow. Uh, he shoots lightning out of his eyes. And if you notice, he's riding it like a horse, but a buffalo, but with eagle talons on it. And the reins are two different colors, possibly representing, you know, if we look at it spiritually, uh, masculine and feminine. And they uh, are power lines. He's a very powerful, destructive character. Well, Black Hawk then becomes well known. And so in, I got a chance. This one I bought early on, but later on I had a chance of buying some Black Hawks, and the person I bought from did not know that they were Black Hawk drawings. But the book I showed you the cover on has examples in it that are very close to what these do. And these show Black Hawk himself, the artist, killing a crow. Twice, two different ones. We also have him belonging to a Red Sash Society as a warrior. Uh, we also have him depicting, and it's in the book also, who his clan tribal leaders are very different, that one up here. The drawings, according to Burlo, depict a whole ceremony, and the, she got notes from a person uh, in the early 1900s that had seen one of these ceremonies and written it down uh, that Black Hawk was depicting. Now, I don't think personally that Black Hawk actually drew this piece in this piece. I think somebody else saw his stuff and imitated him, all right? At the very first of the ceremony, we're gonna have dancers come out and they have hoops. And the hoops represent a window to the spiritual world. All right? But watch, they have feet, they have hands, all they have is the bison headdress. This one has little bells holding the horns together, by the way. And progressive-wise, they're gonna gradually become more bison-like. They're spiritual, it's, it's, so it's a drawing of a spiritual thing as well as a physical thing. And the dancers are all male and they're gradually gonna end up with hooves on their hands and hooves on their feet. They're gonna have hair growing on their legs. And eventually, they're gonna turn in spiritually into the bison itself. And at the very end of the ritual, dance, ceremony, You have the bison there, he's got the blood coming out of his nose. We mentioned that, that means he's dead. Also, he's been gutted. He's also got the hoop, and he also has the spirit lines, and he has two women coming out, dressed for a ceremony, bringing him water, and also butchering him. Possibly, possibly this is Black Hawk. Possibly it is uh, Nadia Lomas. Now, Nigel Lomas is about 1912, right up to World War II, a woman artist, and she's Ogallala, and she's also Spanish. She's a mix, all right? And so she presents some things that nobody else does in any of the other drawings, and that is other animals. Now, in, in, the, Loma, in the Black Hawk book, uh, there are some drawings. Uh, that have to do with antelope. Typically, we don't see antelope very much in any of the artwork uh, that I've seen or in the books, all right? But what uh, Lomas does is she starts giving us hints of what the artist looks like as they go through the transformation sometimes. Uh, that one doesn't have the hooves on it, but that's all right. Uh, in the book, there's plenty of them. But she also starts picking some women's things. Now, she's a woman artist. Uh, when we do most of this warrior stuff, my assumption is those are male artists 
for the majority of the show. This wall has this lady and uh, she produces some stuff none of the rest of them seem to do. Now more contemporary, we got all sorts of women uh, that are modern, uh, contemporary today, 100 years later, uh, who are doing artwork as Native Americans. But what she does back uh, somewhere in the first part of the last century, is she starts presenting women in ceremonies. And I can't tell you why. I just know that I've got one with red birds. I've got one with bluebirds. Uh, we have the women very much dressed up, also having collected certain flowers or herbs in terms of the ceremony. Uh, same over here. And it looks like this flower here, which reminds me, by the way, of a thistle, might not be, is also what's being carried in this basket here for this drawing also. Uh, we also have, I think that it comes from her, or uh, where are we at? A ceremony that has to do with dancing birds. And I think these are woodpeckers, if I remember. I'm going by memory now. And they're doing a dance. And how far that goes into whatever our ceremony, I don't know. We have this one doing more of a ceremonial move. Uh, with birds uh, and we have birds here we have birds down there we also have actually on the sides over here but you can't see them because they blend in with the color blue they are uh, not sure you're going to be able to see the power line coming out here light light blue with the bird same so we have four directions uh, and we have the hoop remember the hoop that we had uh, with Blackhawk and his dancers we have the tube done as a power set right here. And uh, we also have what appears to possibly be a masculine and a feminine then uh, elements, one's one and one's another. Some drawings have more information in them and they're not the artistry of it. It's just not what you say really pizzazzy or really uh, the artist isn't as good as some of the other artists. In other words, we look at the Kiowa delegation, very much a, a very accomplished artist. Here we have, though, a person who probably has more spirituality than some of the other pieces, but not very artistic compared. But what we have is the power lines coming in and out of this bison coming out of the nose, we have the morning stars, and we have power going all over. However, when you get down to this wall and talk about spirituality, both of them have all sorts of elements to them that some of the other art doesn't. We don't have warrior stuff, we don't have somebody, uh, but we do have spiritual stuff. We have uh, a person go to a persona change, uh, wearing a mask, okay? We'd like to thank our sponsor, the Wyoming Community Bank. They allow us to bring folks in from all different fields to talk about interesting things and go into our Facebook page or pick up a flyer at the museum for a list of future programs.